Back in action, gang, we're going to finish up today's lesson with the damped trig functions. So what is a damped trig function? A damped trig function is simply when you take a product of a simple algebraic function. Here, the algebraic function is just this y equals x and a trig function. The only trig functions you're going to be responsible for dealing with are y equals sine x and y equals cosine x. And you'll be dealing with really easy, recognizable algebraic functions as well. So we're going to graph a couple by hand so you can see how this works. But then I'm going to show you what I really want you to be able to distinguish when you're working with damp trig functions. So let's build a t-chart. And I want to, for instance, on 0, say that y would be 0 times sine 0. So of course that's equal to 0. And then if I skip um, pi times sine pi, well, remember, I know that sine is going to be 0 for 0 and any multiple of pi. So sine pi is 0. So the product is 0. Well, I'm going to go through the same thinking for 2 pi and negative pi and negative 2 pi. So I'll go ahead and insert those values pretty quickly. Let's take a little more time looking at the pi over 2s. These you have to be careful with. So pi over 2 times the sine of pi over 2 would give me pi over 2 times. Now, the sine of pi over 2, gang, is just 1. So the product's going to be pi over 2. I can do the same thing here, except now I'm going to do a little more work just mentally and not write as much down. So I have to do 3 pi over 2 times the sine of 3 pi over 2. The sine of 3 pi over 2, I'll manage in my head, that's negative 1. So I get negative 3 pi over 2. Let me do the negative pi over 2. So negative pi over 2 times the sine of negative pi over 2. Oh, remember that negative pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2 are coterminal. So the sine values will be negative 1 in both cases. Oh, but look here. My product turns out positive pi over 2. Last but not least, I've got negative 3 pi over 2 times the sine of negative 3 pi over 2. All right, same thing. Negative 3 pi over 2 is coterminal to pi over 2. So the sine values in both cases will just be 1. Now I need to plot the points. So something a little different than what you're used to doing, you're used to saying that your first tick mark on the x-axis is pi over 2, and this is pi, and 3 pi over 2, and so on and so forth. But now if you look at your y values, your y values are also going to be the pi over 2s. So that's the new thing is to scale the y-axis the same way. You normally don't do that. So we're going to start from the origin out because I want you to see kind of how this is developing. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to plot the 0, 0 point, and I'll work my way out from there. Then I notice I've got pi over 2, pi over 2, which is out 1, up 1. And I've got negative pi over 2, pi over 2, which is left 1 up 1. Oh, wait a minute. Do I see symmetry with respect to the y-axis? I've got pi 0 and negative pi 0. Ah, looks like it's taken shape as symmetry with respect to the y-axis. 3 pi over 2 comma negative 3 pi over 2 would be right 1, 2, 3 tick marks and then down 1, 2, 3 tick marks. And then negative 3 pi over 2 comma negative 3 pi over 2, left 1, 2, 3, down 1, 2, 3. Guys, I am definitely getting symmetry with respect to the or, or uh, symmetry with respect to the y-axis. So this is going to be an even function. You don't have to label that. It's just something I, I hoped you noticed. 2 pi 0, negative 2 pi 0. I can plot those quickly enough. So you might be saying, whoa, what is going on with this graph? Well, if you connect, it's still going to be a wave pattern because sine and, and cosine are always going to give you wave patterns. But it's going to be a wave pattern where there's no fixed amplitude. I don't have a consistent max or a consistent min. In fact, if I follow the pattern, 
what's happening is that um, every other point is going to pass back through the x-axis. I'll graph a couple more of those pretty quickly. So the first uh, wave went out one, up one. The second wave went out one, two, three, down one, two, three. The third wave is going to go out one, two, three, four, five, up one, two, three, four, five. And the next wave is going to go out seven, down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then let me create the symmetry on the other side. And I'm not going to ask you to graph a whole lot of these by hand, but I do need you to be able to do a basic T-chart and plot some points. Now, if you're like, wow, what is going on with this? Well, as the wave gets further and further from the origin, the tops or the bottoms of the waves are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, why is that? Well, if you look at the dampening function, the algebraic function, Um, is y equals x. So if I were to draw y equals x, and I'll use my handy dandy line tool so this looks fairly decent, y equals x, of course, goes through 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, and so forth. And I'm going to draw it in both directions. And then if I also look at its reflection, So I'm drawing in both. That dampening function is determining where the tops and the bottoms of the sine wave are. So the sine wave continues to wave with a normal width pattern, but it's growing in height with respect to the dampening function. So that's pretty cool, right? Now on the next slide, you'll see that all I've done is make a little bit better graph because I used my graphing capability, some of the software that I have. And so that one looks a little bit prettier than mine. So what about y equals cosine x? y equals cosine x is going to be very, very similar, especially if you just glance at it. Like if, if you were to get very far away from the function and kind of look back over your shoulder, the two functions would look fairly similar because you would see that wave pattern that's the, where the waves are getting bigger, bigger, bigger as they grow outward. But I will ask you, can you differentiate what's going on at the center of the graph? And the way to do that is just a quick t-chart. So let's see if we can go a little more quickly through this. Okay, so I'm going to plot the t-chart. Remember, cosine of any multiple of pi over 2 is going to be 0. So I'm going to take all the points that are multiples of pi over 2 and remind myself that cosine of these values is 0. So don't waste a lot of energy thinking through the products. It's going to be 0. And then on this one, it's going to be 0 times cosine 0, which of course has to be 0. Cosine 0 is 1, but 0 times 1 is still 0. So let's do pi. So if I do pi times the cosine of pi, Cosine pi is negative 1, I get negative pi. Well, here I've got negative pi times, now the cosine of negative pi and the cosine of positive pi are both negative 1 because negative pi and positive pi are coterminal. Oh, but that product is positive pi. I need to be careful with my signs. Here I'm going to get 2 pi times the cosine of 2 pi is 1, and then negative 2 pi and positive 2 pi, remember they're coterminal. So I'm going to say negative 2 pi again times cosine negative 2 pi is still 1. So I'm getting negative 2 pi there. Now, I tell you what, before I start scaling my axes, let's go ahead and draw in the dampening functions. So if the dampener... Um, is still y equals x, 
drawing that in to start with is going to make plotting your graph that much faster because you're not going to have to count y values rather than counting y values you'll just go to a point on the green line that's cool anything that speeds it up is nice right so again same ideas a minute ago the dampener or the dampening function is y equals x so I drew y equals x and the reflection of y equals x now let me scale my axes as always so I got pi over 2 pi 3 pi over 2 2 pi and this is because we always want to be real clear with our readers so I've got that I'm not going to do a whole lot of counting um, at all the pi over 2's let me go ahead and plot uh, zeros and at the origin. So at zero, I've got a point. At any of my pi over twos, I've got not just a point, but let me be more specific and say an x-intercept. So the first three are bunched up, and then it comes every other one on the x-axis. Got that. Now I want to um, start plotting pi comma negative pi. So here's pi. Negative pi is, oh, well, hold on here. I don't know if you can tell what I'm saying hold on here for, but, hmm. The answer is probably no. I've got this line, this green segment. Let's try that again. I'm going to try to fix it. And sorry I'm having to do this with you watching because I know that takes a little extra time. Um... But I want to use that green line, and the way I had it set up wasn't very usable. So my bad. I didn't realize that I got a little off when I drew that in, so sorry. That looks a little bit better. Okay, crisis averted. Thank goodness. Did I lose any information when I did that? That's what I was worried about. All right, so let's see here. I was going to plot the point pi negative pi. So once I go to pi, once I know I'm going negative, just go to down to the green line and don't worry about counting like crazy and 2 pi 2 pi so here's 2 pi it's positive so I'm going to go up to the green line and again that way I don't have to count 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 um, let's see here on the other side I have negative pi which is here positive pi which I need to go up to the green line and then I've got negative 2 pi, negative 2 pi. So negative 1, 2, 3, 4. Negative 2 pi is here. Negative 2 pi, I'm going to go down to the green line. So having the dampening function makes it a little easier. Whoa, what is going on here? Well, I can clearly see, for instance, that this wave has to be above and this wave has to be below the x-axis. So I can see that this next point's going to have to be up here so that the wave goes above the x-axis. Now, that means I must be coming in under the x-axis right there. All right, what about on the other side? All right, well, I can see that this is going to be up above and this is going to be down below. So this must be up above. Hmm. And then this one... I can see must go down below. I hope you're understanding what I'm doing. Because I know that in general, I'm going to, you know, if it's, if it's above the x-axis between two points, then it should be below the x-axis on the next two points. So there's my graph. And notice its symmetry um, with respect to the origin has a different kind of symmetry. So I'm not expecting you to always label this, but this is an odd function. So it's... Um, will change up from what I might have expected. And if you look at my better graph, you've already seen what it looks like, but that one's definitely prettier than mine. So it's a nice graph. I just use my graphing software. So what do I really want you to be able to do when it comes to the dampening functions? Guys, I am less concerned 
that you can tell the difference between y equals x sine x and y equals x cosine x, it's important to me that you be able to at least hand graph one of those. But I'm more concerned that when you have three damped trig functions, and notice each of them has a different dampening function. So y equals, or I've got y equals e to the x on the first one, and I've got y equals x squared on the second one, and then I've got y equals the square root of x on the third one. Three very different shaped dampening functions. So I am more interested if you can look simply at the dampening function and figure out what's going on. So do you recognize, for instance, um, when I look at the very first one I've drawn, do you recognize that this graph right here is y equals x squared? And of course, I've also graphed its reflection y equals negative x squared. Well, it doesn't matter if it's sine x or cosine x. I can tell that these two are a match. They go together because of the dampening function. And then on this second one, to the right, can you see this function as being y equals the square root of x? And then, of course, I've drawn its reflection y equals negative square root of x. So I'm not real hung up whether it's a sine or a cosine wave, but do you, can you simply match the equation to the graph because of the dampening function? That's the cool thing, in my opinion. And then last but not least, of course, um, on this last one, do you recognize that this shape right here is exponential growth? And so this one must be its match. That's the big thing I'd like for you to, to be able to sort functions based on the shape of the dampening function. And then just recognize that you're going to have a wavy sine wave or a wavy cosine wave that grows or shrinks in size based on the dampening function. That's it, guys. There is nothing else to do on this lesson. So work in your groups and try to knock out the assignment on this before you leave today. Have a great day, and I'll see you tomorrow.